please join me in welcoming our very special guest, Father Eric Ma. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, UTM and, and Lisa Caballero for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, yeah, when I when I left uh, Oshawa and, and especially left the chaplaincy gig, I, I was uh, hoping I could still get involved with chaplaincy stuff. So um, yeah, this is a real opportunity and a real pleasure. So thanks, thanks, thanks again. Um, just in terms of like behind the scenes stuff, Lisa and I were, were corresponding in, in preparation for this night, like thinking about what to talk about. And um, she came up with some really good potential topics. And one was like holiness when you're, when you're busy, when there's like time pressure and, and you're stressed and that sort of thing. And the other one obviously was the subject of, of memory. And um, both those topics are, are amazing and, and relevant, but um, I guess I, I decided to pick the memory thing, um, partially because it's Remembrance Day. So obviously we remember all those who you know, gave the ultimate sacrifice for us to enjoy the freedoms that we enjoy in this modern world. Um, but also because I, you know, to be honest, I'd never spoken about memory before and especially the way it was phrased in terms of the, the, the title, right? So um, I can't take credit, Lisa came up with the title, um, The Importance of Memory in the Spiritual Life. And um, almost right away, um, when we kind of settled that, on that topic, a lot of things were kind of coming to mind. So hopefully you find the, this particular talk to be fruitful. So I guess what kind of comes to mind, um, just as a, as a starting point, I remember back in the seminary, they would teach us certain kind of technical things like um, how to give an opening prayer at a meeting and how to give a, a blessing, if you will. And so this is something I always kind of remember. I, I kind of admit, I don't, I don't always do this all the time, but it's, it's been instructive in terms of how I approach the spiritual life, if that makes any sense. So basically the, the, the pattern that you want to follow if you're saying a prayer for an opening meeting um, or you're giving an opening blessing if you're a deacon or a priest, wherever the case may be, um, to recall something which the Lord did in the past, uh, to give thanks for that thing, and then from that, you uh, make the petition, you, you form the ask, if you will, right? So, um, so recalling, Lord, how you delivered the Israelite people from slavery in Egypt, we thank you for all the times you deliver us from our own trials in the midst of this, of this uh, troubled world. And we ask you for the courage and the faith um, to, to remember your promises and to persevere through our own personal storms. And maybe you name a specific storm, like going through midterms or unemployment, whatever the case may be. And the thing I, I want to impress upon you, like just with that one example, right? Um, this idea that memory is important because it, it helps us to acknowledge what Lord, the Lord has done, but also it helps us to inform what we're supposed to do going forward. So that was a particular example where it's like um, the memory of God's prior blessings kind of helped us to form the petitionary prayer. But you can see how it might kind of, um, that, that same formula might influence how we um, act going forward. So I, I think it was Father James Nowen who talked about this, where he said, um, rather than ask the Lord to bless what you're doing, perhaps what you might do instead is do what the Lord is blessing, to do what the Lord is blessing. And so um, it sounds poetic and it might sound like, well, where's, where's, where's that coming from? Where's it going? But um, I got to tell you, I do that all the time. So, you know, when I'm, when I'm doing opening blessings at meetings, I might not necessarily follow the formula I just cited. But in terms of my personal prayer, um, I do that sort of thing all the time, right? So, um, like, you can obviously ask the Lord for anything um, at any time, you know? So in the, in the context of your holy hour, if you do a holy hour, certainly if certain petitions or aspirations come to your, your mind and heart, like, you know, obviously feel free to share that with the Lord, right? But what I'd like to do, um, to be honest, is to, sh uh, to save the petitionary prayers um, to the end. And, and what I'm trying to do is, um, during the course of my holy hour in the morning, um, I'll, I'll try to like think about the way that the Lord is, is blessing me uh, and blessing the parish and whatnot. And then from that, um, obviously to, to acknowledge that um, through gratitude and thanks. And then from that as well, to kind of formulate what is it you want me to, to ask for, Lord. And what that does, I mean, certainly it's allowing your, your, your petitionary prayer to be formed by the memory of, of God's prior blessings. But also it's, it's this idea that... Um, um, I'm not allowing myself to kind of do my own thing, right? Like I'm, it's an active way of, of intentionally cooperating with God's grace, right? And, and that's a really um, uh, kind of uh, specific way to, to kind of address this opening thing I want to talk about. How like memory is important because it leads us to a sense of gratitude. So again, memory is really important because it leads us to develop and cultivate a deep sense of gratitude. So um, what I want to do at this point is, is sort of cite a couple of different exercises that you might kind of incorporate in your life to, to kind of stimulate your memory, specifically with the intention of cultivating gratitude in your heart. So one thing, this is it's not something I made up. This is something uh, in the Jewish tradition. So apparently um, a lot of Orthodox Jews, they, they're in the practice of 
naming like a hundred things that they're thankful for before like noon or something, you know, um, or by the end of the day, I forget which one's which, but anyways, um, if you, if you do it very intentionally, um, you can come up with easily a hundred things before, before noon. And, and the thing is like, when you, when you first start naming your blessings, um, they seem kind of silly at first, right? So it's like, thank you, Lord, for the sun on my face. Thank you that I'm alive. Thank you that I feel the ground under my feet and whatnot. And it seems silly, but the idea is that you got to go through that process before you get to the more specific and, and more interesting blessings and graces, if you will. So by way of analogy, it's like, um, you know, when you're in school and you're learning how to write a paper, right? And so, you know, they, they teach us these things now in elementary school, but we don't think they're important, but they actually are super important. Um, you do the brainstorming, right? you put all your ideas down and you do the mind mapping, connecting things and stuff. And then from that, it's like first draft, second draft and, and so on and so forth. And the idea is that you got to go through all those preliminary steps before you get to the final draft, right? And so same thing with, with the uh, cultivating the spirit of gratitude and naming these hundred things, right? Um, you necessarily need to, to name these supposedly silly things to get to the other things where the Lord, again, is specifically blessing you as an individual, right? So um, I'll give you an example, right? This is something that kind of occurred to me recently. And, and this might, I mean, depending on how you look at it, it might sound silly, but I don't think it's silly. So... <laughs> I'm a huge hockey fan, right? So I'm from Vancouver. So I'm a Vancouver Canucks fan. And uh, that was obviously really challenging right now. <laughs> but uh, I'm a Vancouver Canucks fan. And funny enough, I don't watch a lot of sports. Um, this came up in conversation just recently. I was talking to someone and um, they were talking about how they don't watch a lot of sports. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't either, right? But I like reading about sports because I, I love how the human drama is reflected in, in these sporting um, games and stuff like that, right? So Anyways, um, I, I was listening to a podcast where, uh, a sporting podcast, uh, focusing on the Vancouver Canucks. I think it's called Canucks Hour, where one of the co-hosts is this guy named Thomas Drance. And, and Thomas Drance, like, he's really good at, like, um, breaking down the analytics of the game. But he's also really good at um, kind of um, expressing things in poetic ways, which is really important when it comes to media, right? It's not just imparting facts, but it's how you say it as well. And so he was talking about um, the captain of the Canucks, Bo, Bo Horvat, right? And so the, the question came up from the other host was like, well, you know, why isn't Bo Horvat, Bo, Bo Horvat um, kill penal penalties? And um, Thomas Rance was saying like, well, you know, um, I know that that, that would naturally, naturally come up. And, and there's a lot of reasons why people think he might be good at the penalty kill. Um, but that's been tried before and not in a small sample size. Like it's, it's been tried over a long period of time, a huge number of games. And like, it's just not part of the skill set. And so he was saying, like, you know, I think people are deceived because they, they look at Bo Horvat and he's, he's kind of this big guy. He's, he's the captain. He's uh, kind of stocky and strong. Um, he, he's really he's willing when it comes to the back check. Um, he's, and he's a really good faceoff guy. But he's like, if I can use an analogy, this is the kind of the point, right? He goes, if I can use an analogy, it's like when you look at a squirrel and you see the big bushy tail and you forget that it's a rodent. <laughs> so anyways, I just heard that. And I thought, like, wow, that was like really clever. And so, you know, thank God for the Vancouver Canucks. Thank God for like the Canucks Hour podcast. And thank God for Thomas Brent, Thomas Trance. And, and thank God for poetry and all these different things. Now, again, it might seem silly, right? But um, that's, that's the stuff that life is made of, right? It's all these little details. And if, you're, if you take a mental inventory of all these different ways that God is blessing you and, and the people around you and the context of ordinary life, um, yeah, you realize that God is, is, is constantly loving you into existence, you know? So if I can use another analogy, um, I remember taking this, this course a long time ago, um, Good Leaders, Good Shepherds, um, I guess sponsored by the Archdiocese. And so most, if not all the priests in the Archdiocese of Toronto have taken this course. And I remember this one exercise they made us do. Um, it was like, um, you know, when it comes to a, a problem, force yourself to come up with 12 solutions, right? And the idea was a similar thing with the 100 steps, right? The first couple, like they seem kind of silly. Like they're things that you obviously wouldn't do to solve the problem at hand. But the idea is that you necessarily need to get through the first five or six silly proposed solutions before you get to the really cutting edge solutions uh, as articulated in you know, options like you know, seven, eight, and so on and so forth. Anyways, yeah. So that's one thing, right? So, so naming 100 things that you're grateful for before noon, before the end of the day, whatever the case may be. Another thing that's really helpful is to um, be aware of milestones, to be aware of milestones. So, you know, obviously, like as I'm recording this, it's, it's Remembrance Day. So, you know, again, we, we think about the people who fought and gave their lives um, for their countries uh, in service of, of like peace and freedom and whatnot. So uh, that, that's a really tangible example, especially on this occasion of Remembrance Day. 
But to think about other milestones where there's an opportunity to kind of pause and look back and, and be grateful, you know, based on the memory of that which came before, right? So um, graduation, you know, so graduation to not just like, okay, here's a stepping stone to another thing, like stop, you know, I, I graduated high school, I, I, I graduated undergrad, or, you know, for a priest example, like, okay, I, I, I left uh, this, this previous parish, I'm, I'm leaving this parish, I'm going into a new one. Like, I remember my, my spiritual director kind of saying that to me with regards to um, receptions, you know, so obviously when the people, um, sorry, obviously during this time of COVID, um, it was tough to get to have like farewell parties for priests who were transferring parishes. And certainly that was the case for St. Joseph the Worker when I was leaving there. Um, but I remember when I was leaving um, St. Leonard's in Brampton as, as associate pastor, I remember talking to my director at the time and he said, okay, even though there might be this inclination to feel kind of sheepish and embarrassed when you're at a farewell party and people are like talking about how um, you affected their lives and you know, however you want to frame it. He said, it's, it's, those parties aren't really so much for you. They're, they're more for the people. Like it's, it's very important for the people of God um, to express how you mediate God's grace and his love um, in, in your priestly duties, right? And so I always remember that, right? So the opportunity to um, to pause and, and to stop and reflect and to give thanks for the memory of that of that which was. Right? Um, other kind of special occasions, like think about um, feast days. You know, so that's why it's, it's kind of good to know about the different saints. You know, because every saint is a patron saint of something, right? And so it forces you to think outside the box, if you will, because a lot of times we we pray for things which kind of fall within the scope of our immediate concern, right? So. You know, exams are coming up or whatever the case may be, right? But you think about, you know, people like St. Monica, right? You think about the story of St. Augustine, how she prayed through tears for his conversion. And so, for example, once the feast day of St. Monica, uh, to keep that particular tension in mind. So you might not have kids who have fallen away from the church, right? But, or maybe you do. But in any case, when that day comes up, like you pray for people who are struggling with that particular issue. Same thing with uh, Colbe, right? So Maximilian Colbe, like, you know, patron saint of drug addicts. And so again, you might not live in that world where you struggle with uh, drug addiction or you, you know people who do struggle with that sort of thing. But um, you know, the, the memory or recollection of Kolbe and, and the kind of um, the reappearance of his particular feast day creates the opportunity to pray for that particular intention. So that's kind of the second thing you could do to cultivate gratitude. So we talked about the name 100 things. We talked about kind of commemorating special occasions and whatnot. Another thing you can do as well um, is this thing called a general confession. So Everyone here knows what regular confession is, but general confession um, is something where um, you confess everything in your entire life, right? So obviously all those individual confessions they, they took, like your sins were forgiven, right? Uh, but the general confession serves a very particular purpose, right? And I don't, I don't mean to be reductive here. I mean, there's, there's tons of graces that come from the general confession, but I, I've found that whenever I've done the general confession, um, it's made me acutely aware of how God has brought about the work of salvation specifically in my life, right? Um, and so one way to do it, like some people do it when there's uh, the occasion of a change in a state in your, a state in your life, right? So I'm, I'm becoming, I'm about to get married or I'm about to get ordained. Some people do it um, at the end of each year, right? So at the end of the year, I, I go to a priest, I, I book an hour and I, I do a general confession. Um, you know, little side note, don't, don't do the general confession during your regular confession time at your parish, like set an appointment because otherwise... The people behind you will be mad and they'll have more things to add in their confession. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so something to be aware of. Um, but the general confession, it helps you to be aware of, again, how God has brought about his salvific grace specifically in your life. And for me, like it just, every time I do it, it blows me away how faithful God is, how faithful he is, how merciful he is. Um, but also, too, this is kind of interesting. When you do the general confession, you realize that even though there's times where you feel like you weren't making progress, you actually were, right? And, and that's something I think is infinitely relatable, relatable for a lot of people, right? Um, a lot of people are, are in a situation where it seems like, okay, I see, it seems like I'm confessing the same sins all the time, or it seems like I'm struggling with the same things all the time, and there's no progress, right? And yet, when you look back, when you look back, like, you know, a year ago, or five years ago, or whatever the case may be, um, you start to realize that even though things seem to have not changed in, in a significant way, actually, um, they did right? And you're a very different person than you were a year ago, five years ago, whatever. And when you think about how that happens, um, it, it usually wasn't the product of like, 
um, I, I read a book, I, I developed a concept in the back of my mind, and I, I struggled to apply that concept so I can look back and say, like, I, I did that, I manifested the change. Usually it's some variation of like, you know, I went through life and I didn't know what the heck was going on. And a lot of times it was hard, a lot of times it was challenging, and I applied myself to the best of my ability to fight the fight that the Lord wanted me to fight. And at the end of that, I, I, I realized that I'm different, you know, I realized that I'm different. And so the general confession helps to illuminate that particular dynamic in the spiritual life. Another thing that's really helpful in terms of cultivating gratitude is this thing called the conscience examine, right? So examination of conscience is the thing you do before you go to confession. Like everyone knows that, right? Conscience examine is, is a little bit different, right? So it's something you should do on a, on a daily basis. And St. Ignatius talks about this, right? So basically he says, you know, of all the things that you kind of could neglect in the spiritual life, the one thing you, you don't want to neglect, I mean, I'm using kind of exaggerated language, right? Or he's using somewhat exaggerated language. The one thing you don't want to neglect is the conscience examine because it, it makes you acutely aware of how God is actively blessing you in terms of concrete experiences. And again, it informs your future action. So what's the conscience examine? You pick a time every day, uh, morning, night. Some people do it at night, but sometimes people fall asleep if they do it just before they go to bed. So um, I, I, like to do it, I like to do it at night, but sometimes I do it in the morning. You look back on the previous day, the previous 24 hours, and you kind of ask yourself the question, like, where has God been throughout the course of my day? Um, where has he been? How has he challenged me? How has he created, me opp created opportunities to, to bless me? Did I recognize those opportunities? And you know, did I correspond and, and whatnot? So if you read the spiritual authors, like in terms of the Catholic tradition, a lot of people talk about the conscious exam in different ways, and they talk about different steps and stuff. Um, I wouldn't necessarily get caught up in the steps. Like if, if you find the steps helpful, like fine, right? But if, if you just remember kind of generally what I talked about just now, that, that can be helpful too. But if you, if you must know steps, <laughs> um, there's this priest named Father Michael Gately, right? And he has this, this acronym, uh, BAKER, so B-A-K-E-R, right? So that's his acronym for how to do the conscious exam. Um, so Baker, it goes like this. So it's like blessing, um, uh, action, uh, no, sorry, blessing, ask, uh, kill, embrace, and resolution. So blessing, ask, kill, embrace, and resolution. So I'll walk you through it, right? So like blessing, right? Like to take your time with this, like where has God again actively blessed me over the course of the previous day or the previous 24 hours, right? Um, you know, maybe some variation of the name 100 things before at the end of the day, right? So there's that. Um, Action or ask rather, I was get that wrong. Sorry. Ask is basically ask God for the light of the Holy Spirit to, to ask to, to show you basically where how, you know how did God see my day? Because one of those things, like it's one thing for us to be in the moments and, and make certain conclusions about what was important, what was not important, so like what was um, you know what brought about grace, what didn't bring about grace. But to end your day and, and ask the Holy Spirit to to show you like what's God's perspective on these things. It's very informative. Like you realize that a lot of times, many times, the challenging moments were actually the most helpful, were the most instructive, right? Or, or moments where you kind of like, you know, denied yourself, even though it might have felt like a, a total violation of your being in the moment. You look back at the end of the day, you're like, wow, I'm glad I didn't do that, or I'm glad I didn't say that, or I'm glad I had the tempered approach, whatever the case may be, right? Um, kill. Um, I think he's, he said kill just because it makes, that forms the acronym Baker, but uh, kill basically is like you you look at um, how have I sinned, right? So how have I killed the Lord, if you will, through my sins, through my actions, and through my omissions. Embrace is like okay, in the aftermath of of the acknowledgement of my sin, I embrace the reality of God's mercy. Um, and if I don't do that, then I'm just like crushed by my sin. I, I give into shame and despair. And obviously, the Lord doesn't want me to end like that. And then uh, the last thing, R, is resolution. So based on all those previous things, uh, again, my, my memory of God's graces and blessings, how I corresponded, how I didn't correspond, that informs what I do in the future. So I'm actively trying to do what the Lord is actually blessing. So that's, that's the Baker thing. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's a really long way of saying that one real tangible um, benefit to cultivating a sense of memory is that it in turn helps you to cultivate a sense of gratitude. The other thing uh, to consider with regards to memory in the spiritual life, though, is this notion of the sacraments, right? So this comes up in a really prominent way when it comes to the holy sacrifice of the mass, right? So this is my body, this is my blood, um, do this in memory of me. So that word memory, right, in the context of the gospel, in the context of the mass, it doesn't simply mean like I recall that which happened before, 
right? Um, but it's the word in the Greek is anonesis. And, and the idea there is that um, something is made present, which happened before in the past. And it's not like the thing happens again. It's like the same thing, right? So you apply it to the mass, right? Like what's, what's the thing which is re represented, if you will? Um, it's, it's the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, right? So the idea is that whenever there's the mass, it's the representation of the one true sacrifice of Christ, not just at the, at the cross or on the cross, but at the Last Supper. So what that means, practically speaking, is that when you look at the mass, right, it's, it's um, the Last Supper, it's the cross, and the Holy Sacrament of the Mass, like all those three things are like kind of one and the same. Now, you think it through, like, what does that mean, right? Okay, so in terms of the Mass, like in terms of what it is, right, it's not just a celebration, it's not just a meal, but it is also primarily a sacrifice. Specifically, the Eucharist is the sacramental presentation of the crucified Christ. And the idea is that if I have clarity about that, that the Mass is the sacramental presentation of the crucified Christ, it should affect the way that I enter into the sacrifice of the Mass, right? So obviously, you know, obviously, like a sense of, of reverence, right? So do I approach the Mass, not in the sense that it's simply a celebration or a meal, even though it is those things, but do I approach it with a sense that primarily it is the sacramental presentation of the crucified Christ? A certain reverence should obtain if I have clarity about that in the back of my mind, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. Like, uh, I remember once in a parish setting, I was um, training um, extraordinary ministers of communion, like Eucharistic ministers, as to how to give up communion and whatnot. And so I, I covered certain kind of basic things. But then I remember I came to like dress code and I said, well, I'm not going to give you like an exhaustive list of things that you should wear or not wear and that sort of thing. Just keep in mind that you're, what you're giving is the Eucharist. And the Eucharist, again, is the sacramental presentation of the crucified Christ. So given all that, what do I do? What do I not do? What do I wear? How do I give a communion? All those different things, right? Like a bunch of ideas should come to mind. It's not meant to be exhaustive, but it's meant to be a creative love in response to the crucified Christ and the sacrifice that he did um, so long ago. Um, the other thing that, that kind of um, comes to mind in terms of having clarity about, you know, what Christ means by do this in memory of me, um, it helps you to kind of bring a proper intention to the table when it comes to the mass. So, this is kind of an interesting thing, right? So in, in the mass, like around the time of the prayer of the offerings or the, um, uh, the offertory itself, right? There's that really interesting phraseology where the, um, uh, the priest says, you know, my sacrifice and yours, my sacrifice and yours, right? So the idea is that, okay, I, I bring to the table at, at mass, like all of my um, hopes and dreams and aspirations, my, my failings, my shortcomings, right? And I, I unite the sacrifice of everything I've done, everything that I am, to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which is then offered up to God the Father, right? So that's, that's the image you're supposed to have um, when it comes to the whole sacrifice of the Mass, and it's particularly that, that part of the Mass, right, where gifts are being brought from the back, and the priest is dressed in the altar and whatnot. Now, where do you find this um, in Scripture in terms of a, a kind of a clear analogy? Like, think about the multiplication of the loaves and the fish, right? So, it's like, okay, the Lord, um, he sees the, the hungry people, like, you know, the, obviously it's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And you remember, like, the disciples are like, okay, this thing basically is beyond us. Right? These people are hungry, um, and uh, yeah, so you, Lord, you got to send these people away to the nearby villages, towns, wherever the case may be. And you remember what the Lord says, like, it's all about the details, right? So first of all, what he says is, you feed them, <laughs> right? And the Lord, like, he's not, he's not trying to be cheeky or mean or whatever, right? But that's, a, that's an important part of that miracle, right? So, okay, these people have left everything to follow the Lord, but now um, the Lord asks him, okay, give everything that you have. Give everything that you have. And what it is, is five loaves and two fish, right? But that's a very important prere prerequisite to the miracle that the Lord is going to perform, right? Give me everything that you have. And every time it is going to be completely insufficient to address the problem at hand, right? Again, we're talking about hopes and dreams and desires and whatever, deepest desires of the human heart, right? But what happens is that your sacrifice is united to the sacrifice of the Christ on the cross offered up to God the Father. And that's the thing that feeds the multitude, right? That's the thing that feeds the multitude. Now for us, I mean, it's, it's one of these things. When I go to mass, am I intentional about offering my nothing, my, my, my variation of the five loaves and two fish? which is everything that I could give, but again, is insufficient for the task at hand. And do I have confidence that, you know, Christ will unite that sacrifice with his sacrifice offered up and offer up to God the Father, and that in turn, the blessings that I can't obtain on my own 
will be given in service of all those things I just enumerated, hopes and dreams, deep desires, people you care for, people you love, right? If you have that in mind, um, when you're going through the mass, um, it changes everything. It absolutely changes everything. So uh, something to keep in mind going forward. Other thing to consider with regards to the sacraments, right? Um, you know, this, this idea that, um, you know, when the Lord, when the Lord gives you absolution, right? Think about the phrasing of that, right? So it's one of these things, we're so used to it, we don't really think about it, but how it is, it's like um, the priest says, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, right? And the thing about it, like, I mean, that's, that's kind of weird, right? We're so used to it as a Catholic people, we don't even think twice about it, but you shouldn't the priest say, for example, Jesus forgives you, or Jesus absolves you of your sins, or the Lord absolves you of your sins, or God absolves you of your sins, but he doesn't say that, right? He speaks in the first person. And that's even weirder, right? Because like, you know, I can't absolve anyone of anyone's sins, right? And so, and yet those are the words that I'm called to speak in terms of the rubrics of, of that particular um, sacrament. And what it means is that, you know, in that moment, even though it sounds strange, um, Jesus is speaking through the priest to the penitent, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But how often we forget, you know? I'm half going to go to confession and we're like, oh man, I'm like worried about the priest, you know, or I'm like selective when it comes to like this priest versus that, or I'm thinking about anything other than the fact that Jesus receives me personally and intimately. Right. Um, I remember that happened to me once, like, I think it was before I entered seminary and I, I, um, I was confessing my sins and then it wasn't like a, it wasn't an invalid confession, but there was something about the way I was confessing my sins where the priest at the end of it was like, yeah, okay. So now imagine you're talking to Jesus. <laughs> And uh, it changed everything. I was embarrassed. I, I, I gave the same confession, but in a completely different way. Because like I had forgotten. I had forgotten that like the sacraments are the privileged place of encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so again, I'm, I'm like constantly mindful of that, right? Um, another example with regards to um, confession, like, and so as I mentioned in the outset, like I, I used to be a lawyer. And I remember at one law firm I was at, we went for drinks. And I don't know if the the other people in the firm knew I was Catholic or not, but they were just like ripping on the Catholic church. And in particular, they were ripping on the sacrament of confession, right? And the, the idea um, was basically like, oh, what do Catholics believe? So like, we're like what, the Catholic, what do Catholics believe? You can like, you know, do anything, any heinous sin or any heinous crime and like go to confession and your sins are forgiven. Like what, what's up with that? And it was, it was said in a, in a mean and malicious and disrespectful sort of way. But, you know, there's something to that. I mean, there, there was something to that in terms of how they phrased their objection. Because, you know, even though their, the way their terminology and the, the phrasing they used was, again, disrespectful and all those things, um, they were touching on something really important that a lot of Catholics neglect. This idea that the sacrament confession is, is amazing. I mean, it really is an incredible thing. Like, I can go in there with my garbage and the Lord forgives me of my sins, and he rejoices that I come to him, and that he has an opportunity to bestow mercy and grace and, and love uh, upon me in that particular circumstance, right? Um, now, for us as the penitent, it's important to remember, like, what is actually happening in the sacrament confession, right? Because it's like, what brings about the forgiveness of sins? It's not like the priests. It's not like your penance. Um, it's not even me waving my, my hand over your face, right? Um, it's like, by the blood of Christ, your sins are forgiven. Like all the sacraments derive their power from the Paschal mystery, the suffering, death, resurrection, and glorification of Christ, you know? Um, and so when I go to confession, it's not about, okay, you know, Father, give me a longer penance so I might like, you know, work on this thing. No, like your penance is your penance and the priest does the ritual and you're forgiven every time by the blood of Christ. And so like receive that, you know? Now, how this plays out in terms of a practical example, like there's a lot of, people a lot of people like me you like everyone right we have this thing where it's just like okay I, I you know we've had these moments where i go to confession and here are the things that i've done and i failed to do and they're not like you know kitty things or like you know i've i failed the lord in these different ways right and the key is like how do i leave confession like do i do i own the fresh start right do i own the fresh start do i receive the forgiveness of christ do i really turn the page on my past sins and allow myself to re be reborn yet again as the new Adam, if you will, right? Um, or do I wallow in a sense of shame and, and despair and emptiness and all those things, right? Um, Father Mike Schmitz talks about this. He has a great video about like, you know, forgiving yourself, right? And so basically what he says is like, yeah, I mean, 
if there's an opportunity for reparation for making up for the wrong that you've done, like for real, but at the end of the day, like even when we do that sort of thing, it's some variation of the five loves and two fish. Like I can't make up for sin. I can't make up even for my sin, never mind the sins of the world. So Christ needs to die for my sins. And rather than be weighed down by that, to, to rejoice in that, like, you know, here's the Lord who loves me so much that he died for my sins and allows me to have this peace that I enjoy right now and to have this fresh start. And, and so the way that Father Mike puts it, it's like, you know, if you have, you know, the, the weight of the consequence of your sin, and not to mention your shame, and your sense of guilt and whatever, and you find you're struggling with that, like, put all that under the aegis of God's lordship. You know, Lord, you are the Lord of heaven and earth. And I, I, I give to you not just like the things I want to give to you, like, you know, the fruits of my labors and stuff, but I give you to my sin, my shame, my, 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 my aching hearts and all these things. Um, because when I pray into it, like, I don't think you're calling me to take these things on or to allow myself to be crushed by these things. And so even these things are, are given to you and put under the aegis of your lordship. And if, it's, if that's the case, if I've done that in the aftermath of confession, then I, I trust that you're going to take care of it, and therefore I don't have to, right? So anyways, so that's the thing with, with the sacraments, right? So memory helps you to, to enter the sacraments more fruitfully and with just better intention. Another thing that um, the uh, memory does, it helps you develop a certain confidence when it comes to navigating your own personal storms, right? So um, basically the whole thing with this, right? You got to have uh, an acute memory of what God has done for us as recorded in his sacred word, you know? So like as a preliminary example, think about um, the Annunciation, right? In the Annunciation, like whenever that particular scene is depicted in art, um, you know, Mary visited by the angel Gabriel, right? Um, she's always holding a Bible or holding the Hebrew scriptures, right? And what's implied is that, okay, like I've, I pray like a lot, but also I prayed with his sacred word. And so I know what God is like. I know he's merciful. I know he's faithful. I know he's everything that the Bible says that he is. And so therefore, when he invites me to participate in a very, very meaningful sort of way, obviously, in the work of salvation, um, I'm not afraid. And I can lean into um, this invitation because I, I trust in the Lord. I trust in his promises and I trust in who he is, right? Because you got to realize, I mean, like the Blessed Virgin Mary, yeah, okay, will you be the mother of Savior? It sounds like, you know, amazing and stuff. And it is, right? But it's amazing, but at the same time, it's like she knows that if you're an unwed mother at that time, at the time of Christ in that particular cultural setting, you could be stoned to death, right? And so, okay, here's this thing, and it seems like if I do this thing, it will lead to disaster, but I trust that the Lord is faithful and merciful and all those things. You find a similar thing with like Abraham, right? So Abraham, you know, go sacrifice your son, um, not like just any son, but your favorite son, Isaac, right? And so, again, it's sort of a metaphor of like, you know, do I trust the Lord with my hopes and my dreams and my deep desires and all these things, right? And, and what's implied is that Abraham is able to make that journey and, and go right to the point where he's about to sacrifice the thing he loves most in this world because he trusts in the Lord. And why does he trust in the Lord? Because he knows the Lord through prayer and through a really careful study, again, of a sacred word, right? Now, in terms of the gospel, you'll, you'll see this um, come up time and time again, right? So, um, most prominently, I would suggest, when it comes to those stories of Jesus with the disciples in the midst of storms. So in the interest, in interest of time, I'll, I'll go through these things kind of quickly, right? But there's basically two stories where Jesus encounters the disciples in the midst of storms. Well, first of all, he sends the disciples in the midst of storms. Like, he does it on purpose, right? So, um, and the idea there, again, is he's not trying to be mean, but basically the idea is um, you, you grow a lot by going through your own personal storms. Everything's very purposeful, right? So there's two stories, like Jesus asleep in the boat and Jesus walking in the water. And the idea is that if when I go through my own personal storms and I have the memory of what Christ is trying to teach these disciples through these two episodes, it should give me a certain confidence in this of my storms, right? So like, again, just for the sake of time, Jesus asleep in the boat. First of all, he's asleep in the boat, right? And the idea is like, look, um, he's not worried. He's not afraid. He's not... Uh, He's not scandalized, right? He's totally in control. He remains the Lord of heaven and earth. And that's why in, in one variation of that story, even when they wake him up um, and they're like, they're terrified and they're freaking out, like he's, he's not worried, you know? He says some variation of like, why are you worried? And the storm's still going on. And, you know, they're, they're saying some variation of like, are you kidding me, right? And, and that's, that's instructive too, because it's like, you know, um, what's the peace that Christ wants to give to us? The peace that will persist in the midst of storms, right? 
Um, Jesus, like, um, walking on the water is a slightly different thing, right? So when Jesus um, comes to disciples walking on the water, um, he comes to them at what's called the fourth watch of the night. And the fourth watch of the night is, is I think, somewhere between two and, and four in the morning. So they've been rolling against the waves for like a really long time. And then the Lord comes, right? So even for us, like there's moments where like, when's the Lord going to come? And it seems like he comes at the fourth watch of the night, right? And to realize, okay, well, gosh, he did that with the disciples too. There must be a point to it. Um, and then he says, like, okay, like, do not be afraid. It is I. And again, for the sake of, um, you know, mindful of like time, right? Like, whenever you look at the, at the Bible, Old Testament or New, whenever people are like freaking out, um, the Lord always says some variation of be still and know that I am God, or be still and know that I'm fighting for you. Um, it's the analogy you find in the Lord of the Rings, right? So, like, you know, we're like Frodo and Sam, like, we, evil seems really close. So we're walking like, barefoot <laughs> towards Mount Mordor, right? And it seems like we're all alone. But if you look at the the whole trilogy, constantly throughout the whole like, the scope of the three movies or, or through the books, um, like the Lord is fighting for these for these these guys. Um, they're totally on, on their side. They're very powerful. And um, even though it might seem like nothing's going on, um, don't be fooled to think that the Lord is not doing his thing uh, just because we have no like, like super active part in it or um, he seems to be asleep in the bone, right? So, okay. Um, one, one final thing, I'll kind of end with this. So memory helps us to inform the way that we evangelize. It helps to inform us in, into the way that we evangelize. So um, to use a, a really kind of concrete example, like think about St. Peter, right? So St. Peter, like um, he screws up a lot throughout the gospel because the guy is pretty thick-headed, right? And even when it comes to the Last Supper, um, he, he makes that boast, right? Like, Lord, even all these other guys deny you. I will never deny you, right? And, like, imagine he became Pope then, right? Imagine if he became Pope then, then, then what's his, what's, what are his efforts to evangelize? Like, I'm, I'm trying to spread the good news or, or teach theological concepts to these people that I kind of look down upon, and these people I kind of despise. Whereas, you know, once he realizes that, that I'm the guy who denies the Lord three times, like, before the cock crows, then his evangelization efforts are totally different. It's no longer condescending. It's no longer despising the people who are, who are the recipients of the good word or the good news. It's like, I'm a hungry man showing another hungry man where to find food, you know? Um, and so it's like, look, um, I was nothing. Um, and the Lord just came to me and he loved me. He showed me mercy. And I just want to bring you to that well, um, to bring you to the one who was, who was merciful. And so at the end of his character arc, you know, Peter is able to be merciful to others as Christ was merciful to him, to love others as Christ was, has loved him. Um, so it, obviously, again, that the memory of, of what Christ has done for him affects the way that he evangelizes and it just affects the way he, he lives out the rest of his life. Anyways, I think I'm way over time, but um, thanks for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Father Eric, for that very insightful talk. Um, we can now open it up to a period of question and answer. So if you have questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself and ask it here, or um, we've been posting in the chat that link. Um, once you click on that link, there's a session that says questions for Father Eric. Um, you can click on that and ask your questions there anonymously, but if you don't mind doing it in person, then feel free to unmute. And we'll have Michelle maybe helping to moderate the questions that are coming through um, on the Pigeonhole app. Yeah, we've got quite a few questions already, which is really good. So our top one so far, okay. I often find myself not going to confession because I feel awkward when telling my sins to a priest, but how would you help me overcome this barrier or hesitation in going to confession? Yeah, really good question. Um, what I do personally um, is um, I entrust the whole experience to our Blessed Mother. And, um, and I, I name the thing that I don't want to mention first. And also I, I go into the situation with um, a sense of like joyful expectation. Like, Lord, um, I expect great things from this thing in spite of the weakness of your messenger. And um, at the same time, like uh, I'm going to give a variation of the five loaves and the two fish. So it's not going to, 
it's not going to fail, if you will. That's too strong language, right? But it's not going to fail just because I was timid. Like, I'm going to go in boldly into this thing and fully expect amazing things despite my fears and apprehensions. And I always find that that works tremendously. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Our second one. Um, I've never made a general confession before. In addition to booking an appointment with the priest, what would be involved in preparing for and making a general confession? Um, I don't think you need to make tons of preparation, to be honest. Um, but one general way to do it is people go through like, like obviously if you've been through school, it's, it's kind of easy that you trace based on your grades and, and whatnot. So grade four or five undergrad, whatever the case may be. Um, yeah, but it, it's one of those things. It's, it's incarnational in terms of the manifestation of grace. Like when you're, when you're in the moments and you're kind of receiving the grace of the sacrament in the moment, things kind of come to mind, you know? So I don't think it's something you need to put in a lot of preparation into. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is the core of it just like recall your life, like go through those points in your life? Um, yeah, because it's almost, about? yeah, like to use an analogy, it, it's like, um, it's like when you go out with a friend, right? And uh, you're telling them about an experience that you had. And it's like, it's like the communication of the thing and like the, the reality of the relationship and the conversation um, helps you to kind of like um, identify for yourself, like, like what that experience was really all about, but you don't know it until like you're actually sharing it. You know, so I think it's in a similar way, like with that's what happens with general confession. Mm, okay. Here, next one. If remembering the good things God has done brings about a spirit of gratitude, what can we do when our memory is bombarded with a lot of negative experiences or wounds? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, that's something I, I forgot to mention. Um, so with regards to the mass, you know, I talked about putting on everything, um, well, mass and confession putting everything under the lordship of, of Jesus, whether we're talking about the offertory, the five blows, two fish thing, or like in the aftermath, the confession, do I, do I leave the Lord, my, my sin, my shame and stuff. Same thing applies with, with your wounds, you know? So like, I remember once talking to, to a spiritual director and, um, you know, I was, I was talking about basically this type of thing, like, you know, wounds and personal wounds and stuff like that. And, um, he said to me like, okay, Eric, um, you're very analytical and you've thought this thing, thing through a million different ways, right? And I think the time for analysis is over. And what you need to do is just surrender all these things to the Lord, right? Now, if there are opportunities um, for you to look at things a little more deeply and stuff, like you'll feel God's call on that. But um, something I, I've realized more and more, and this is something from my spiritual director too, from back in the day, <laughs> you'd be amazed how little thinking has to do with the spiritual life. You know, and it's not to say that, you know, you don't have an, a great intellectual tradition and, and you shouldn't think and that sort of thing. But if you really think it through, like, okay, like when it comes to things over which I have really no control or things which leave me feeling despondent or despairing, um, it's a really good move to entrust these things to God and let him lead you if he wants you to think more intentionally about this aspect or that aspect. Uh, maybe this one's kind of related. So if you want to expand on it uh, sure. through this one. Uh, yeah. Any advice on how to let go of memories of the hurt of our sins after we've gone to confession? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we're taking the time to dwell on this one. <laughs> so <laughs> like, so basically, like to use an example, like um, forgiveness, right? So forgiveness, it's not like forgive and forget. So whoever like, you know, came with that expression out, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's not about that, right? But the idea is like, um, okay, here's this wrong that I sustained. And maybe the person did mean it. And maybe it was like, you know, there's serious wounds that I've sustained as a result of that wrongdoing, which I'm still suffering from now, you know? And so just as a starting point, like a, a prerequisite to forgiveness is not like wearing rose colored glasses and saying like, well, the person didn't really mean it or like it wasn't a big deal. Again, maybe it was a big deal and maybe the person did mean it and maybe the person's not even sorry, right? But forgiveness has nothing really to do with, with them in it per se. It's not, it doesn't depend on them doing anything. Like reconciliation, that's a different thing, right? To be reconciled. Yeah, the person does have to do something, right? <laughs> Reparation and all these things. But forgiveness is this thing. I, I think of it like a trust exercise or like it's some variation of like, hey, Lord, here's this thing which is like beyond my control. And um, I, just, I just entrust it to you, you know? And so you care about justice and reconciliation and making all things new way more than I can. And what's more, you have the power to actually do it. And so um, I just give that to you, you know, like the example that comes to mind, I remember, um, I think his name was Father John Cameron. He was the uh, editor for Magnificat magazine. And he was talking about how um, 
it was kind of a longer story, but he he had this uh, he had this like kind of off Broadway production, um, and he was being interviewed by someone from the Village Voice, which isn't a Catholic publication, and uh, and so basically that person was saying, oh, so basically, Father, you just do like Catholic plays or something, right? And he knew that was a that was a precursor to her dismissing everything that he he did, right? And so what he said to her was like, well, look, I I think I think all drama is uh, is all drama is Catholic. So basically the idea was like, okay, she said, he said, like, think about the aspirations of the human heart. We long for truth. We long for justice. We long for love and all these things. And so, um, so she said, okay, well, just to pick one, one example was like justice, right? So he's like, okay, um, do you want like a little bit of justice, a lot of justice or infinite justice? And she had to say infinite justice. And basically, you know, he was saying like, look, um, you got to admit that we live in the world where, um, not only is it not perfect or infinite justice, but it's like disproportionately the opposite. And yet you still have this, this deep desire in your heart. And so like, what do you do with that, right? And, um, and so she had no answer. And, and so what he said was like, okay, we as Catholics, what we believe is that, you know, we, we cry out to the Lord who has put these deep desires in our hearts. And we trust that in his own time, in his own way, in the fullness of time, um, he will realize these deep desires. So I can trust these things basically to his Lordship, you know? And then she said, I want to change the subject. And that was, that. you know, <laughs> anyways. Mm -hmm. Wonderful answer. Thank you for that one. I know I found like, yeah, when recognizing that forgiveness is, it's, it's the choice that I make. It's freeing myself from this burden. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully that means healing in their own life as well. But like recognizing like I have the ability to surrender that to the Christ right now. Like I, my own healing and my own forgiveness. And hopefully that in turn leads to their forgiveness and growth. Yeah, like Pope Benedict talks about this, where he's like, a lot of times we're afraid of the final judgment, but like, you know, yeah, there's the reality of like judgment, but the other part of it is like, that's the time when all things are made new mm -hmm. and all the, every tear is wiped away and stuff, right? So like, do I believe that? And, and so if I, if I trust the Lord uh, with my hopes and dreams and my wounds, and I believe in like one day, all things being made new, then therefore I don't, I don't have to take that on, you know, and I could be free today. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so good. Okay. Another question more personal for you. Yeah. Uh, how did you decide to start a podcast and any tips on getting started or having a successful podcast? Yeah, right. Um, thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> well, basically what happened is, um, uh, yeah, like I, I got the equipment before um, COVID actually. And I was had in the back of my mind, like, like back in the day, like I, I wanted to be a filmmaker like a long, long time ago. And I actually applied to film school in Vancouver and I got in and I just thought about it. It's like, no, I don't think so. I think God wants me, wants me to be a lawyer. And then apparently he wants me to be a priest. <laughs> so, but uh, anyways, why those things? But um, for, for podcasts, um, I think what's really helpful is just watching a ton of YouTube videos, to be honest. Um, there's a, like a lot of people are producing a lot of great stuff in terms of like, you know, different types of equipment and how to uh, get the right settings on, on this and that. And to, I, I learn stuff like all the time, you know? And so... Um, even the setup I have right now, it's, it's different than my usual setup and just because I'm in a different location. And um, yeah, I, I watched like probably like 10 videos, like, you know, couple, within the last couple of days, just to make sure things are like tip top, you know? Um, yeah. So like, you know, when I started Catholic Latte, it, it kind of seemed to be a, like a certain way right after, right after the hop. But in reality, I was just like learning a, a lot, you know, but fortunately we live in an information age and there's a ton of great stuff out there. The other thing too, I would say with podcasts is like, you just got to like, um, like not wait for the perfect scenario, but just like, just put out content. You know, if you look at like, um, uh, people have been doing this for a long time, like Peter McKinnon and whatever, you look at their earlier stuff, it's, it's so bad, <laughs> right? Like production wise and whatever. And there's a certain point where like, you just get better by, by doing, you know? And so don't be afraid of making mistakes, um, and, and play to like what actually you feel passionate about and what, what interests you and, um, and watch a lot of YouTube videos. And that's a pretty good start. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, okay, another one. I've often heard the expression, offer it up to God or surrender it to the Lord. Could you expand on what that means and what it looks like to do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember there was this American priest, Father John Ricardo, he talked about this and he said, you know, yeah, basically it goes to this idea of working image of God, right? Because when you hear offer it up, no one's like, super excited by that. And then more to the point, like, what does that issue mean? Right. Um, and so I think it's the way to think about it, right? Like basically um, um, when Christ 
suffered and died on the cross, suffering was forever changed, you know? And so suffering now has this redemptive quality. And so it's, it's not meaningless, but, and it, and it ha- not doesn't just have a point, but that's the particular and primary means by which salvation is brought to the world, right? And so when I unite, when I, um, when I offer it up, like I'm not even uniting my sufferings to the sufferings of Christ. I'm just remembering that that's the case, that my suffering has salvific meaning because Christ has already done the work of dying on the cross and uniting our, his suffering with our suffering um, in terms of like, you know, affecting the past and the future and certainly the present. So when, again, that the phrasing is, is awkward, but the idea is that when I'm suffering, to remember that Christ suffered and died for my sins and forever transformed this experience. And so, um, yeah, my, you know, precious in the eyes of the Lord is death was faithful, right? And so I, I can go forward knowing that um, my suffering has a point and, and my life has meaning. Wonderful. Okay. Another more practical one. How long should I spend doing an exam of my day or an examination of my day? Um, it doesn't have to be like super long. Like um, even if, like, cause that's the thing with like, um, uh, what do you call it? Like the, the you know, thing like, like Baker or whatever, like, like you don't, don't think of it like I gotta go through all these steps. Like the way I've heard it explained to me, even if you spend all your time on like just counting your blessings, you know, and there's this natural kind of end to it. Like um, go to where the spirit's kind of leading you. Like it shouldn't be an oppressive thing, but it's, it's um, yeah. If, if the Lord calls you to, do it for a while or, or, or do it in a shorter sort of way. Um, just go with that. I think maybe in the early going, when you're getting used to it, it might take a little longer because you're just trying to get used to doing it right, if you will, you know, but um, after a while, it'll become a little more, it'll become a little more organic and natural. And then you'll feel the sense of like, okay, like the Lord sustains me in this type of thought for this period of time. And then after that, I, I stop move on to the next thing. Okay. Thank you. I definitely yeah. struggled with that. Just like, how do, how long do I go? Do I just go through yeah. the motions? Yeah. Okay. And one last. Oh, oh sorry. I was going to say, yeah. Cause like the general principle is it is again, it's almost like um, being aware of God's blessings such that I might inform my future action. Right. So that's kind of the idea. And so um, with the whole gratitude part of the talk, it, the idea was um, to get used to doing that almost all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. And so then when it comes to the conscience or the, um, yeah, the conscious examine, like your, uh, it's, it's almost like pulling together all that, that work you did throughout the day, you know? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Just one more. Mm-hmm. As a priest of the Archdiocese of Toronto, would you ever consider being a Toronto Maple Leafs fan rather than a Canucks fan? Uh, you know, that's pretty funny. <laughs> you know, I, I knew I wasn't a Maple Leafs fan because like I, when I moved to Toronto, like many years ago uh, to work as a lawyer, I, I saw like this uh, Leafs game where like just, they just got killed and uh, I felt nothing. <laughs> like I wasn't, I wasn't emotionally invested at all, but now when the Canucks are struggling, as they've been struggling for years, like I feel it. <laughs> so maybe one day it'll change, but I don't know. Well, there's hope. There's possibility. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. Thank you so much for these answers. Really good and definitely helpful. Oh, no problem.